Hi everybody, welcome to Talking Automotive with Mark and John. My name is John Sinclair and my co-host Mark Palavestra. Hi John, today we've got Mark Sibbald. Mark Sibbald is the Sales Director for Hancock Tyres here in Australia and he has some really good information on the tyre business, the size of the industry, the dynamics and some of the challenges and opportunities that the business presents. Talking automotive, analysis, identification and implementation of profit opportunities for the automotive ecosystem. Let's get into it. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services is an independent division of Precar Services, offering specialty fleet fit-outs for commercial applications ranging from simple tray and tow bar fitments to fully bespoke service body and accessory installation. With quality assured safety, compliance and standardisation of vehicle builds, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. For further information on how Precar Fleet Services can assist in solving your commercial vehicle fit-out needs, please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Thanks, John. Today, we've got Mark Sibyl, the sales director from Hancock Tyres. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Mark. And and hello, John. It's it's great to be here. I've been plowing through uh, the episodes. I think I'm up to episode 19 and really enjoying the content. You know, excited that I can be a part of it and hopefully informative and uh, as your other guests you've had so far. Now, maybe just to start off, can you maybe just give us a a bit of background to the tyre market in Australia? And what sort of volume and dollars do you see in the in the market? What sort of size of the market? Yeah, um, it's a good question. We're a little bit different to, I suppose, the, the automotive new car industry. We don't have a VFAX reporting system telling us how many how many new tyres are sold every month. It's not as transparent, I suppose, the word is. Uh, we have a, an Australian Tire Industry Council, and, and, and most of the major brands are a member of that, and so we all contribute data there. Not, unlike cars, people can import tyres directly themselves without actually being a manufacturer. So we estimate the market is about 18 million new tyres a year, re- retail sales. Within the Attic members, it's probably closer to 14 uh, million tyres a year, and we work on... we. We talk units, uh, we talk volume, um, you know, dollars is, is obviously an important part of it and you would like to sell the more expensive tyres rather than the cheaper tyres because the revenue. But yeah, we mainly talk in units. So as far as a, a market in Australia, traditionally Bridgestone and, and Dunlop were the two two main brands in Australia and it goes back to the local manufacturing heritage. Uh, I think it was Holden, you know, chose Bridgestone and Ford chose Dunlop. So they're probably the, the long-term uh, brand in the Australian market place but manufacturing finished in i think it was 2008 bridgestone uh, closed down their factory in south australia there hasn't been any local manufacturing uh, since then of, of tires i suppose that legacy still continues in the market today bridgestone's still the market leader the estimates 20 percent market share for bridgestone which is quite high and then you'd have uh, goodyear dunlop coming in second as a maybe sort of 14 15 percent market share and then you move on to brands like hancock and, and kumo as uh, as coming in you know around third i think we're number three in the market. Kumo have a number of different brands they operate in the markets. You know, combined, they, they're they quite strong, but they're maybe not just in one brand. And then um, you, you, you're quite a step down to to other brands like Pirelli, Continental, Michelin. So whereas Hancock uh, would be maybe 8 or 9% of the market, Continental, Michelin and Pirelli, um, they're, they're maybe sort of 4 or 5% of the market estimate. And mainly because of their, their range of tyres. Uh, Michelin being a premium brand, premium reputation, you know, you mainly traditionally find them on the high-end vehicles. So their, um, you know, their market, the, the available market for them is probably a lot smaller than a, a brand like Hancock that has, you know, passenger cars, high-performance, uh, four-wheel drive, SUV and, and truck tyres. So, Mark, question for me, the, the tyre market, VFAX measures the new car market. It's measured to death. There's so many permutations and combinations, re-market shares and volumes, et cetera. But the industry outside of, I guess, the tyre side of things, where are as to what is actually happening in the tyre space. So one question for me is, is that is the tyre market growing? Or is it flat or is it declining? And, and what are you seeing as, as far as the, the trends? I suppose 2020 was meant to be our year. Like as far as, you know, new car sales declining for, I think, 
close to 18 months, uh, we as an industry and certainly I expected um, you know, people to start maintaining their cars. So we were expecting a lot of growth this year. You know, People aren't buying new cars, so they're main- holding on to them. So tyre maintenance starts to become an issue and, and, and so tyre sales. And I was basing that on uh, the GFC. So back in, in the GFC uh, or post-GFC, when new car sales also declined, the tyre industry had, a, had had some significant growth. I think it was sort of 9, 10, 11 were fantastic years for the industry. But since then, it, it, it kind of has been fairly flat. It's you know one percent a year, I think, is is the growth rate uh, through uh, we, we we measure through the Australian Tire Industry Council, where most of the major brands are, are members. It's not quite as um, as you know measured and and transparent as VFAX, but we do get a good indication of what's what's going on. Yeah, twenty twenty was meant to be the year, but then COVID uh, COVID's obviously changed everything for everybody. So we're certainly hoping next year there'll be a lot more growth uh, as people get out on the road. You know, international travel still restricted so people will be driving around the country and with the lack of new car sales or or sort of lower new car sales people are maintaining uh, their existing vehicles and and that that means tires hopefully. So in terms of automotive coming up into COVID we saw a lot of the automotive dealers were coming under profit pressure we saw a lot of the smaller dealers being bought up by the bigger groups what's happening with the outlets in terms of the tire industry Are, are they less outlets now or are they growing? Or? Yeah, there's been a real shift. I suppose the internet, um, it, it's changed many industries, but it's really it really changed the tyre industry. And uh, probably back in 2012 was was around the time that it became really invasive uh, into the traditional tyre retailer space. Typically, you would go to a dealership and get your car serviced or you go to the mechanic and get your car repaired. They'd tell you you need tyres. So the next weekend, you'd drive to the tyre shop and you'd get your tyres fitted. And that was a model that's operated, you know, I think globally for a very long time. Post-GFC, uh, dealerships started sort of looking at tyres and realising that they could do that. So there was more outlets. So I suppose that traditional tyre retailer has seen increased competition from mechanics, small workshops, but also car dealerships as well. So the n- total number of outlets has probably increased or the places available to source tyres or purchase tyres from has probably increased. Whereas your traditional tyre retailer, someone that only does tyres, they're probably you know not as you know popular. You know People are branching out into, into other other services as well, be able to get more margin and more GP uh, from from their customer. Is, is there a rationalisation of, of outlets or, or are there more outlets occurring? I don't know whether it's a rationalisation because uh, there's, there's definitely been a, a bit of a, a generational change, I guess. So a lot of older workshop owners have transitioned, uh, sold their workshops or moved on, retired. You know, the barrier to em- entry into a workshop is fairly low. For 20 grand and sort of a, a, an upfront bond on a, on a property, you can kind of buy a tyre machine. You know, you can even get a hoist these days and you can be up and running as a workshop, fairly, fairly low investments. We've certainly seen a lot of new businesses pop up in, in metro areas and probably related a little bit to the immigration as well in that, you know, new new people are entering the country, bringing a whole lot of skills that they operated in their in, in their previous countries. You know, so you've got that continual turn or turnover or, or re invigoration of, of people into the industry. So yeah, not really a decline in um I don't I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think in Victoria, for example, there's maybe three thousand businesses registered with the VACC as automotive workshops. I think I don't not exact number, but I think yeah, that's a lot of different businesses. And and if you're a mechanic, you can sell tires. So there's no reason why you have to, someone has to sell tires and someone else has to do servicing. And now uh, you can do anything. So there's more outlets. So are there fewer specialty tyre uh, outlets or are you seeing that tyres are becoming integrated into the, the mainstream mechanical workshops? Yeah, I think I think there's definitely fewer specialty tyre outlets. Probably the last remaining specialty tyre outlet is is the Bob Jane T-Mart network. So they're a, traditionally the largest network selling the most tyres nationally and, and they're stuck to their guns. They're stuck with tyres, whereas um, some Jacks is another retail network. They, they do tyres and mechanical tyre power stores uh, do tyres and mechanical, the My Car Network do tyres and mechanical. All, all, all those national chains uh, have gone down the mechanical path, uh, except for Bob Jones, and they're probably the last true independent tyre only only retailer. Have there, what sort of trends were there, have you seen in the market both coming up to COVID and then now uh, sort of mid and going as we start to head out of COVID? Have you seen any particular trends in the industry? Well, yeah, co- like COVID related, you know, the in- industry, uh, you know, really I think it was April that, that we all we all got scared. I think like most other industries, uh, the market 
dropped by 30% pretty much on the 1st of April and, and stay you know, quite low or, or at that level for the entire month. So what a lot of businesses cut back their staff. You know, A lot of businesses were operating casual, so the casuals um, were, were let go. JobKeeper changed that a little bit, but certainly most of the good businesses you know, restructured their costs and, and, and became a lot leaner. So then when it picked up again in May, they were, they were more profitable. Uh, they were said to be making more, you know, perhaps more money than they've ever made because they had, they had very low cost structures because they geared down for that 30% decrease, but then the market picked up and they were selling and there was you know, job keeper money in you know, floating around. There were reports in Queensland of a lot of superannuation money going into tire and wheel packages on four by four utes and, and things like that, like re- the recreational spend. And then June, so June, uh, I'm pretty sure June was the highest month uh, or biggest month ever for the industry in Australia. It's jumped significantly according to the attic figures. And I, I haven't been able to go back far enough, but it looks like June has you know, the biggest month ever for the industry industry. So it was quite surprising. That's quite amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very amazing. So, you know, once again, if you put it on the consider that everyone cut their costs back from all the retailers, uh, reduced their costs significantly and then found themselves with more work than they can handle. It was quite a good good time for the industry. And then, you know, July and August, you know, stayed stayed relatively strong. September was a bit a, a bit softer at retail conditions. And now the, the feedback from the industry is the, the stock challenges, the global supply chain is what's uh, probably the main pressure point at the moment. The New South Wales port issue a month ago where we couldn't get containers into into the New South Wales ports due to industrial action, products not being shipped out of Europe because factories have closed, you know, second lockdown uh, closures happening in Europe in November as well. So a lot of supply problems. And then um, talking to people who are involved in the shipping lines, they're, they're getting a lot of demand on the shipping. So there's an increased demand on shipping, which restricts the space for, for products like tyres to be shipped. So then that tightens up supply as well. So, so as, as I go around and visit independent each tyre store or each chain, there's lots of different stories about certain lines being out of stock, certain products, certain brands. So yeah, that that really does seem the pressure point going forward into into Christmas, where traditionally that November December is a really busy period as people consider holidays and and with the borders you know opening up or planning to be opened up, a lot of driving is affected. So um, yeah, it's going to be a real challenge in the next couple of months. Now, Mark, you mentioned the challenge of supply. What, from a bigger picture, like supply, I'm guessing, is something that's COVID accelerated, the supply challenges. From an industry perspective, what are the biggest challenges that tend to be the main obstacles in the business or, or the ones that you focus all your energy on to overcome? What's, what are the main problems? Well, I suppose probably the biggest challenge for, for retailers and, and manufacturers is uh, uh, proliferation of sizes on, on vehicles. You know, if you go back to the local manufacturing days, especially in the 90s, you you had one or two sizes on, on a Falcon or one or two sizes on a Commodore. So you kept maybe two brands or three brands in five sizes. Stock management was very easy back then. You had a lot of European vehicle or you, you, you had European vehicles, but those customers kind of knew they had to wait. They chose a European vehicle, so they didn't expect the same service as a, a Commodore or, or a Falcon owner. But now, like you guys know, the number of manufacturers, the number of models, times manufacturers, times models, times tire sizes, and then often the European stuff have a different size, size on the front as they do on the back. Yeah, trying to carry that range of stock at a retail level, it's almost impossible. And then trying to, as a manufacturer, carry that, that, that range of stock is impossible as well. And just as an example, we, we, we deal with a number of um, manufacturers, you know, Audi just announced recently the new RS6 and RS7 models will carry Hankook tyres as original equipment. And I think it's probably the third generation that Hankook's been the original equipment on those models. So we those tyres get made in our Hungary factory. And so Audi's announced the, the launch of the vehicle. They, they'll have three or four different tyre suppliers. So the vehicle arrives in Australia in January at the dock, turns up to the dealer in February, tyre gets damaged and the dealer says, oh, it's got a handcook, let's ring handcook. We didn't know it was coming at the time frame, so we ring Hungary and they say, yep, no problem, six months later you can have the tyres. Meanwhile, you've got the, the consumer with the vehicle potentially on the road. So that, that proliferation of sizes and, and, and number of OE fitments is always a challenge for the industry to manage. It's it's amazing that theme keeps coming through. That's something that John and I often spoke of uh, in the when we're just on the new car side, and we've interviewed a, a few MDs of global organisations. And complexity is the enemy, is the expression we use. So the complexity that the OEMs create 
creates the nightmare for the tyre industry because, you know, it's one thing to have all the model proliferation, but then we throw the curveball in that we will change the spec of tyre midway through a product life cycle so that even adds in more complexity. Yeah, we, we, have, we, have, we have one example with Hyundai who we work quite closely with uh, over the years. You know, the, the Hankel product is it's closely aligned with the Hyundai product, but um, I think Hyundai change locally changed their source of product from Korea to um, uh, Europe, Europe, and in Europe was a different tyre that was fitted. Essentially the same vehicle coming into the country, but a different a different pattern of hand-cooked tyre was being fitted to the vehicles in Europe compared to the vehicles made in Korea. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, because we spoke to Mark Whitfield, who's the president of the African Association for Automotive Manufacturers. That's one of the things he brought up was a big challenge there, is that complexity and how they're trying to see if there's a way to simplify some of those models to be specifically for Africa, that you don't have the, all the variations that and supply between countries countries in Africa than than importing vehicles as much and that. So it's quite an interesting situation. Mark, in terms of average kilometers, can you give us an idea of the mainstream tires? How many kilometers are average? I know that's very difficult because it, it, it depends on driving uh, situations and difference between trucks and passenger cars. And But can you just give us a rough idea of what the expectation should be? It is really interesting and customer expectations are, are different as well. So I suppose my, my first advice is tire pressure and tire maintenance are the key. I often tell people maintain your tire pressures and the tires will last forever. It is so important to maintain your pressure to to get the, the maximum wear life out of the tires. But like as a guide, so we, you know, as our company cars, so we we run Toyota Camrys at the moment and the reps uh, on our passenger tires. So that's on a, a normal run of the mill mum and dad passenger tire. They're getting anywhere from 60 to 70,000 kilometers, you know, out of their tires. That's that's actually, I'm, I'm really surprised it's that high. Yeah, it, it is. And, and if I go back to being, a, you know, my days as a mechanic and even in, in the fleet management uh, world, sort of on the Commodores and Falcons, getting, you know, 40,000 was good. So there's certainly a lot of product improvement, you know, like they're not just bland, round and black with a hole in the middle. You know, every generation, it's like a new iPhone, every generation of tyre, there's there's new developments and the rubber's still black, but the compound is so much different and so much improved. You know, they're still round with a hole in the middle, but the carcass and the construction get improved with every generation as well. So, you know, whenever I do a product presentation, I'm always talking about a wider footprint or a better contact patch. And the more contact you get on the road, you know, the more the tyre is connecting the road when you're driving, the more even where you get. So certainly tyre technology has come a long way in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, um, getting a lot of mileage. But that doesn't apply to every every, every car and every tyre. One of the big challenges we have as an industry is people who go out and buy a luxury SUV or even a even a Hyundai Santa Fe, for example, uh, with a 19-inch with a or maybe a 20-inch tyre on it. You know, those large, heavy cars uh, don't always respond well to the type of driving someone might have done in their Toyota Corolla or, or or Mazda 3. So if you're not maintaining pressure and you've got this really big tyre and really heavy car, you, you, the mileage can be significantly reduced. And, you know, on a luxury European uh, brand with a 20, 22 inch tyre, if you're not maintaining the tyre, you, you, you're 20,000 k's, even 15,000 k's out of, out of a tyre. They wow. get quite get quite expensive, and it's not the, the, the vehicle manufacturer's fault. It's not the you know the tire company. It's not the, the product or the quality. It's it's just the maintenance that, that makes a big big difference. And so that's where you get those challenges. Someone who uh, maybe moves out of a, a Toyota Camry, for example, and then hops into a you know an Audi Q7. You know, in the Camry, you can get away with not checking your pressures and drive it. Uh, like a rental car, I guess. But as soon as you get into your Q7 and and, and you're not paying attention to the tyre pressures uh, or the maintenance, uh, the tyres can get, get worn out quite quickly. And is there a trend you mentioned before as far as the super money being used, superannuation money being accessed to buy performance wheels and tyres? Is there a trend to performance tyres, the low, like lower profile or more sportier, grippier type tyres? There's probably two trends going on. One is driven by the manufacturers, the vehicle manufacturers moving towards Towards a higher higher rim uh, diameters, we certainly are moving closer to 18 and 19 inch as being more popular than they ever were before. The, the yeah, still the most popular size in the country is a 205 55 16, which is your you know, Toyota Corolla, Mazda 3, Hyundai i30 sort of common size size tire. So that that's emerged in the last few years, taking over from the traditional Australian locally manufactured tire, which was a 215 60 16, which 
I think the, the Mitsubishi Magnus, Toyota Camrys, Falcons and Commodores back in 2006, they were manufactured with, with that, that tyre. So it's taken a long while for that that tyre to work its way through the market and, and get knocked out of the top three. And yeah, we're definitely seeing an increase in, in eight-inch sizes and, and definitely seeing an, an increase in nine-inch sizes. You know, the other trend which relates more to the aftermarket and, and cosmetic side is the four-wheel drive uh, market. Maybe maybe 10 years ago, you would have walked into a tyre shop and they'd have a whole lot of aftermarket rims and they'd all be for passenger cars. Now, they're all for four-wheel drive. So all the money all the money is in all-terrain tyres or mud-terrain tyres fitted with black for your Hilux or your Ranger or your, your Mitsubishi Triton or even your know, Amarok Isuzu D-Max. Certainly in Queensland, uh, you can definitely, there is definitely uh, more of that sort of vehicle and those sort of tyre sales in, in, in Queensland compared to Melbourne, for example. But even in Melbourne and Sydney, you're getting a lot more black wheel, all-terrain tyre packages being fitted compared to, you know, 10 years ago when it was all maybe 20-inch wheels being fitted to Commodores. It's amazing how the market moves. <laughs> I always think of the, the bigger wheels for Commodores and Falcons and lowering. We're, we're now going bigger wheels, chunkier tread patterns and lift kits. It's got the other way. Um, and it presents some, you know, some occupational health and safety safety challenges for the industry as well because you know a 205 55 16 tire is, is fairly light um you know sort of in the background here i've got i've got one and i can you know pick that up quite easily but you know you move to a um you know what i was i talking to a customer today about a 285 75 16 and so same diameter but you know a lot wider and it's it's a lot more rubber a lot more heavier and then you move to maybe a, a 245 50 20 i think is you know it's a an all-terrain tire now that's quite popular and it's a lot of tire to lift. The people who are fitting the tires, you know, their their jobs changed a lot. You know, they're he- heavier to lift, so you've got to consider the ergonomic aspects of getting them off the car, or on the car, getting them on the tire machine, lifting the wheel and tire. Uh, around but then you've also got to consider the storage aspects so so having a tire this wide you can fit a lot of them on the rack but when they're this wide you know so it's cash flow in the business it's a lot of different and you know when you and then when you add that to the number of sizes or more sizes so you you kind of got bigger stock and you've got to carry more of it you know a real structural challenge for the industry um over the last couple of years and then moving forward and with that, Mark, do you find that there's now more a more reliance on you as the tyre supplier to the repair shop? So they're not carrying the inventory and they're relying on just-in-time supply for you to carry that inventory and deliver it to them really quickly because I've got a client in my workshop, I've sold them four tyres, I need to get them back on the road from a mobility perspective and I need it to be a, a, a really good customer experience. So I'm going to be putting pressure on you to get those with tyres to me straight away. Yeah, definitely. It, it is quite interesting because 20 years ago, the local tyre shops probably used to carry the stock and then supply maybe the car dealership through a sublet and they would be their just-in-time inventory. But the the car, the tyre shops can't carry enough now to, to be that just-in-time for the dealership. So there's a whole um, you know almost new uh, channel or a new segment where some some competitors or some businesses have realised that, and uh, they're they're using an online ordering model, and then then using a kind of a one hour courier service to pick up from our warehouse and then deliver to the car dealership. And you know, so the, the consumer really won't be paying any more, but the margins are being squeezed along the supply chain because the the prices are transparent; they're online, so you can pretty much as a consumer find out what you should be paying. So the car dealership can't charge any more. You know, the manufacturer has still got warehousing costs and um, and logistics costs so uh, you know some people have been quite smart and being able to find ways to reduce that, that middleman cost and and still deliver the service and providing one or two hour delivery to a, to a car dealership that may may need the tires to provide the, the service that the customer expects yeah you know, what was really interesting for me when we lived in Nordic is everyone had winter tires fitted. So the beginning of the summer, you had to come in and change and put your summer tires on. Yeah. And then you had these sort of tire hotels for storage of all these these rims and tires. It was, it was quite fascinating. But it was good business because that was a good chance to check the tires and say, okay, well, you need new tires for next year and then sell them a set of new tires at the same time. So a lot of dealers in that were very much involved in that business model. Yeah, I'd love to have that in Australia, you know, the opportunity to be able to see the customer twice a year just to forget about selling. That's obviously a bonus and, and, and why you're in business. But just to have that relationship with the customer would be fantastic. And we, we don't get that opportunity in Australia. And in some states, we get annual radio inspections or annual annual vehicle inspections that allow you know the retailers to kind of have, have some sort of annual relationship. But even that's changing. I think in New South Wales, it's five years now before you need to get your vehicle inspected. You're not getting that opportunity to see the cars. Uh, 
as often as you would like. It's an interesting point you raise about even just the, the text lifting these wheel rim combinations because well, those LCVs and with the lift kits and the bigger wheels and the bigger tyres, big chunkier tyres, uh, from an oh and perspective, that actually might be must be a real challenge in your workshop or in your warehouses but also for your uh, your suppliers to supply to the uh, end user. Now, with passenger cars are slowly washing out with the growth in LCV and SUV, bigger tyres, but those tyres tend to wear out faster than what the passenger ones are. Would that be fair to say? Performance tyres in the bigger rim sizes, yeah, definitely uh, wearing out faster. Yeah, when you get LCVs or light commercial tyres, they're, they're pretty resilient. You know, the, the construction of the tyre and the rubber compounds, are, you know, they're designed to be tough and durable. So they're certainly, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're doing okay, but it, it probably globalisation. So I suppose going back to your days in Renault, you know, a Renault van, you had several different models that you could choose from. And, and they'd be those, those larger medium-sized vans are becoming more popular in, in Australia compared to you know when it was just yeah high ace and pretty much all you could buy or a Mitsubishi Express you know that 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 sort of gone to that proliferation of tire sizes the high ace ran one tire size the uh, Mitsubishi Express ran one tire size but now those European vans run multiple tire sizes tire wear is probably not the issue because you know those European vans and you know like people know how the, you know, the manufacturers are used to them in Europe but you know as a retailer once again bigger more sizes to carry bigger bigger tires to carry more cost involved trying to get the right stock. Back to my days when I was uh, you know, on the floor, it's actually working on uh, on vehicles. Often you would get clients that would want passenger tires to be fitted to their LCV. Does that still happen? Is that still is that still a challenge? Because they didn't want the one ton. They wanted the performance type radial, but didn't want the one ton harder compound type tire. Is that still a challenge? Because it gets there are issues around load carrying, etc. Yeah, it, like I suppose from from for Hankook as a as a wholesale or a manufacturer, we I don't get to uh, experience it on a day-to-day basis, but I certainly do cringe when I pull up next to the tradie with a nice set of wheels and he's got the wrong load rating tires on there because it looks good and he's carrying around the whole lot of whole lot of supplies or, or machinery. So I, I don't think it's uh, I think I, I think with the trend towards moving towards all-terrain tires and the wheel tire and wheel packages that I mentioned earlier, that's eliminated some of it because you know they're wanting those tires that are designed for those vehicles, which is okay. But yeah, you still do see the odd van. And, you know, it's been lowered, looking really cool, mind. Like it looks a million bucks. You know, it's got 20 inch wheels and it's lowered and everything like that. But yeah, the, the load rating and you know the capacity of the tires don't match the capacity of the vehicle. So yeah, it is a bit of a, an issue in some some parts of the industry. Now, in terms of uh, truck tires, what percentage of the market is truck tires, and do you get involved in that sector? We're Hankook uh, are, are actually uh, are really really big in the truck tire market. I, I I don't know the the exact numbers, and I probably should know them, but we're, we're we're probably one of the largest wholesalers of truck tires to in non-contract fleet, I guess. There's, like there's different ways you can break the market down. So when you look at people like Toll or Australia Post, they're they're one part of the market and, and you have players like Bridgestone and Goodyear that supply those customers and they, they need a national network. They need, you know, uh, they need consistent pricing, consistent service, and they really need um, like a, a big brand that's been established and can supply that supply that network. And and Hancock certainly meets that criteria, but our market is mainly in the owner, not all owner driver or owner carrier. So it's not the one, we, we have a lot of customers who are operating one to three trucks, but we also have those guys that are running 20 trucks and carrying their own freight. So it may be a, a business that manufactures uh, kitchen equipment or something like that. And instead of contracting someone to carry that freight for them, they'll own the trucks and run the trucks and and, and, and pick the tire supply. So Hankook's really big in that market. And um, we, you know, we've got a really strong following. We've got really great products. It is an important market for every every tyre uh, manufacturer in Australia because we move so much good and so much freight around on trucks. And Mark, I want to go back to the supply chain and life cycle of tyres. And you mentioned that's a big problem right now, especially with uh, with COVID. So given that you mentioned there's no manufacturing anymore, Bridgestone was the last manufacturer in Adelaide. They used to be across the road from Holden. So it was actually a match made in heaven for, uh, for that contract supply that they had for many, many years. So where do the majority of our tyres come from? And and because when we look at cars, we we, we we bring cars in from uh, mainly Japan, Korea, uh, Thailand, and then we have the American product, and then we have the European product that comes across, and then a spattering from India and uh, and some from Mexico. But where are the main supply? 
supplies uh, destinate or countries, uh, source countries, uh, where Australian tyres come from. Yeah, well, I suppose it really hasn't changed. Um, the fact the tyre factory is still next to the car factory, even though it's not based in Australia. Um, generally, wherever the cars are coming from is the same place the tyres are coming from. So for Hankook, uh, we, we source product from Korea. Uh, so we have fact- Hankook has two factories in Korea, and they're, they're located where next to the car factory. So uh, Hyundai, Kia are two of the big uh, manufacturers there. We also, uh, for Australia, we source product out of Indonesia. So a lot of car factories in Indonesia making for the Indonesian market. So we get to uh, source product out of there for our for our market as well. And then China, a uh, lot of car factories in China. So so Hankook has three factories in China. And then then Hungary uh, for the European market. I mentioned Audi OE supply before. So Hankook's OE supply to Audi, BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen. So our factory in Hungary does all the supply to those, those vehicle manufacturers. And I think you'll find the other brands will be very similar in that, you know, the people who supply forward, the, the t- cars are made in Thailand, the tires are made in Thailand. Uh, relationship still continues as a supply chain purposes. Now, Mark, we've seen the impact of COVID on supply chain and the shortage of tires as a result of that. But do you see any long term, any other things that could impact the supply chain? Yes and no. We're certainly currently experiencing uh, some, some issues with the global COVID uh, impacts of factories closing and, and shipping capacity. But there are so many options for consumers in the Australian market. There's so many brands available. There's so many uh, suppliers available that really no, uh, you know, no long-term supply issues for consumers or, or concerns of, of being able to supply in the market. You know, there's a lot of ad hoc supply out of China where individual retailers might buy a, a container of product with a generic brand name to satisfy demand. And because they're a small independent business, they can make decisions to source that product and supply their customers. And you know, a global brand might be a little bit tight on one size, but you know, there's an entrepreneur somewhere that can source the product and supply it to the retail consumers. Are there any ADR ramifications for that? It's, uh, that's probably one of the, the biggest things the industry is trying to work on and, and, and work against. There's, there's no, uh, other than speed and load rating, there's no ADR or any any uh, information or laws that says can only fit this brand of tyre or this specification of tyre. If a tyre comes in from a no-name brand and it's got the right speed and load rating on the sidewall to match the tyre placard of the vehicle, then effectively the uh, the tyre is legal. Whether that manufacturer has done any R&D on the tyre or whether the tyre has been tested, really no checks or balances to, to confirm whether that tyre is suitable for the Australian market and Australian road conditions. Yeah, brands like like Hankook. So we we make a number of different tire patterns and and designs around the world. And each tire that we we bring into the market has to be approved, has to be authorised. Uh, the rubber compound has to suit the local conditions. Yeah, the speed and load rating. So every now and again we do find some patterns, and we call them parallel imports. I think most people in the automotive industry would be familiar with parallel in some some shape or form. So people will bring those tires into the market, and they may be the wrong rubber compound. They may look exactly the same and they may, you know, they're round and black with a hole in the middle and they've got a handcook logo on them, but they may not be the right compound. They may not, they may not be the right construction. So the ride and handling characteristics won't be the same. They potentially won't grip as well or they may wear out faster. So it could be one or the other, good grip or no grip. <laughs> A case recently um, it was was in the news. I think it was uh, down in Victoria. A, a consumer had an accident in their vehicle, and they were insured by SunCorp. And on inspection of the vehicle after the accident, it was determined that the tyres weren't suitable, and and so the insurance claim was denied. Uh, well, you know, as an industry, you, you don't like to see that, and there aren't many cases you hear of. But earlier this year, that was certainly one case that made the news, where the insurance company found the tyres, whether they were at fault of the accident, I'm not sure. But you know, the judgment in the appeal that said that the insurance company was within its rights to deny the claim based on the condition of the tyres. Quite a big risk and impact on safety in that, so it's quite serious. And that's, uh, I think, one of the questions, I'm, I'm, I can't remember which one it was, but you asked about selling tyres and, and what are the challenges with selling tyres and consumer indifference is probably our biggest biggest challenge as an industry. The general thoughts are they're round and black with a hole in the middle and they all look the same, so they must, you know, I just buy the cheapest ones, which is, is certainly far from the truth and it's like like any product or any service, once you kind of investigate or you've, you've spent some time, you know, in the industry, you start to realise, you know, how, how different all the products are and how significant R&D is and how significant quality brands are to deliver the, the performance that consumers expect. Now, Mark, you spoke earlier about 
the challenges of having all the different tires and sizes available in stock. In general, what's the sort of average month supply that you try and keep in the market? So from a manufacturer's point of view, I suppose three to four months would be ideal stock to keep. It's a constant juggling app between cost to storage costs, keeping your costs as well as, you know, retailing and having the right mix. Individual tire retailers, I suppose there's a bit of a, a line in the industry. They kind of say that you can't sell what you can't what you don't have. Yeah, you know, certainly the, the successful retailers will carry as much stock as as possible. Yeah, you know, they want they know from a tire purchase uh, cycle or, or a tire purchase decision process that people don't just walk into a tire store and say, oh, just looking, you know, just wanted to make sure they're still black and round and yeah, no, I'll be back in six months. Uh, if they're in your store, they're in there to buy. So you've got to, if you don't have the stock, then chances of them coming back to your store are diminished. So you either need to have the stock and take the wheel off and get them a cup of coffee and, and make them comfortable while you borrow it from someone else or get supply from, from another warehouse or, or fit the tire. So having as much stock as possible is very critical for the retailer. I mean, is there a measure around that though? Do they say, well, okay, I sell, I don't know, 100 tires a month, therefore I need to have 100 in stock at any point, or they run it on a, on a shorter cycle to say, I need this many here in the showroom at any given time? There's a lot of different metrics that that, that, that they use. Some some old-fashioned retailers use you know, number of units. You know, if I sell 300, I've got to keep 800, maybe as an example. Some retailers use dollar value of stock. You know, they're talking dollar values. Other retailers like some of the national chains they try and educate their their franchisees to keep a top 40 and so they say that we know these are the 40 most popular sizes in your pma in your 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 local area so you must keep three sets of each of these top 40 so it really does depend on the retailer uh the you know, whether they're independent they're part of a national chain and ultimately it does come down to cash flow as well you've got to be able to fund the stock yeah every, every retailer probably treats it slightly different and then once you when you import the tires do you bring them into the major centers and have large distribution centers in the major cities or do you dist- distribute into regional areas straight away? Yeah, that, I suppose that's uh, probably similar to a lot of other products. You know, 20 years ago, you would have multiple regional warehouses, smaller warehouses and keep the stock in different places. But now, you know, so Hancock has a warehouse in uh, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth. And these are big warehouses in the traditional industrial areas. And for Metro, we'll provide two deliveries a day and overnight delivery to regional areas. So it, it does cover most of the requirements uh, for, for retailers. In, in Tasmania, for example, there'll be a large hand-cooked customer that will act as a like a, a wholesaler and they'll store a lot of tyres and supply that, that daily service to some of the smaller accounts on the island and then get bulk orders from, from Hancock once or twice a month. There's those sort of uh, regional wholesalers that, that are still surviving uh, quite successfully in the industry because, of, as I've mentioned several times, a number of sizes are required to keep a small retailer can't do it. So they need the bigger the bigger uh, warehouses to stock everything. And you mentioned model complexity. So and uh, in the auto business, there's you know, always a new car with a new bit of technology coming in. What sort of innovations or products are coming in the tyre space. So, you know, what is coming and what do you see further down the pipeline? As I mentioned before, it's like an iPhone. Every new, every generation of tyre is is new and improved. The cycle seems to be about four to six years for a, for a new new tyre. Um, so it's similar to a, to a new vehicle model cycle, but compounds are de- definitely improving. One of the examples I use in, in the training that I do with customers, my daughters, they, they like to bake cakes. And, you know, when they were six, uh, they used to bake and they chuck it all in a bowl and they'd give it a bit of a stir and in the oven and they'd go daddy you know here's the cake can you tell us how it tastes and you'd bite into it and it'd be full of unmixed cake mix you know it's all it's not quite right now they're a bit older they're you know they're like the country women's association the cake is beautiful it's soft it's light fluffy and i suppose the analogy is is with compounds in in tires the the rubber the the development or the improvement in tire compounds are very similar when silica was first introduced trying to get the silica to stick to the rubber was very hard so you get great performance but you wear the tires out really quickly. So over the years, the manufacturers have just got better at mending, blending the different chemicals together, much like a cake mix. And you know, the more even you can blend the silica and the rubber and all the other polymer fillers together, the better wet weather performance, the better grip you get, but then you get better wear life as well. So there's a number of factors like that that are just continually improving with tires. And I suppose when I mentioned before about the mileage of 60 to 70 thousand kilometers on tires, both of you were surprised. So that's just an indication of how they have improved over the years. One of the other trends coming in is quietness of the 
tyres. Yeah, manufacturers are, are looking for tyres to be quieter on the road because the vehicles are a lot quieter as well. So yeah, they spend a lot of money reducing the noise, noise, vibration and harsh, harshness of the vehicle. Last thing they want is noisy tyres on the road. Uh, designing you know, tyre construction, but also tread patterns in a way uh, that reduce noise, reduce airflow. Several of the hand-cooked tyres have sidewalls on the tyre that are designed in a way to disrupt the airflow to reduce the noise. You know, minimal things. And when I show this to customers, they laugh at me and I kind of point out the feature and I explain the benefit and they kind of, are oh, you kidding, surely? And I have to explain to them, no, I've seen I've seen the test lab in Korea, I've, I've seen the microphone, I've seen the road, I've seen you know, the soundproof booth where they, they measure all this stuff and this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to reduce the noise. Some are Audi, uh, the Q7, I think it is, the Hankook OE tyre has foam inside the inside of the tyre and it's called a, sa- a special foam, which is a sound absorber. You know, much like you would see in the sound studio or a recording studio, you have that foam to reduce the, the noise in, in the recording studio. <laughs> tyres are now being developed with sound absorbers inside the tyres to reduce the noise. That's amazing because when you think about it, with electric cars, the noise is the road noise, not the car. Yeah, yeah, and that's a big thing. That makes sense why so much effort's going into noise reduction with tyres. Yeah. And another question I was keen to ask you is, obviously with with environmental and and CO2 and fuel consumption, low rolling resistance, how is that achieved? I suppose that's a bit like the 11 secret herbs and spices, I guess. It's it's probably a combination of things. I'm, I'm not the technical guy so I probably can't give too much detail or, or, or it's definitely in, in the compound like that. as the compound gets better it, it gets reduced as the tread design gets better it gets reduced contact patch the tyre so the construction so in the old days the tyre used to look like this so when the weight of the vehicle went on it it went like this but you're still only getting like this part touching the road these days tyres are designed more like this and the tyre touches the road for the whole time so you're getting a more efficient contact patch so you're getting less pressure on the road, which reduces the resistance, which then gives you better fuel economy. So there's a number of smart and clever things that people are doing in the R&D that actually improve and reduce the result, improves the tyre performance, which reduces rolling resistance. You mentioned EVs uh, before as far as, you know, yeah, there is no noise, so the tyres need to be quieter. Yeah, that's the next sort of frontier of of tyre development because the EVs are are a different, yeah, there's more torque coming through the the wheels with the electric motors. There's a different weight distribution to uh, traditional internal combustion engines, quieter as well. So uh, Hankook's investing quite a lot in tyres for for electric vehicles. And, you know, we we announced last year that Hankook will become the official tyre supplier for the Formula E, a global motor racing series. So to me, that sort of sends a signal of, where we're heading as a company as far as technology and where we're heading as a business and where we see the future. So much like many brands did with Formula One, they developed the tyres to be the best in Formula One uh, to prove their performance capabilities. It, it looks like Ankle's you know, focusing on that EV market and sponsoring the motor racing, electric vehicle motor racing, so they can get better at developing tyres for, for electric vehicles, which you know are going to be the future of the motoring world. I certainly know from an EV manufacturer point of view, and the Korean manufacturer is Kia and Hyundai do it, they have you know, sounds that come out of the car at low speeds and it's actually quite you know i think the, the hyundai from memory is quite a happy tune so from a pedestrian safety point of view if if an ev is driving past at low speed you hear this really you know happy soundtrack to let you know that you know the vehicle's nearby so that's the only reason i can i can think of noise uh, was an electric vehicle for pedestrian safety i was just a curiosity i was reading the specs on the latest uh, genesis suv that got released this week and they actually talked about harmonic reducers inside the tire inside the tires as well so it didn't sound like the a sound absorber as part of the tyre, but it sounded like a harmonic noise reducer as part of the rim inside the tyre to reduce noise coming out of out of the vehicle. Now, Mark, do tyres perish over time in storage and also on vehicles? Is there a sort of limit that once you've had your tyres on your vehicles, you know, even if you're doing very low mileage, you should replace them after a certain period? It, I suppose it comes back under the, the heading of tyre maintenance and also related to ADR and, and rules, question Mark asked before. So, so I suppose first, yes, uh, tires do deteriorate after time, and that you know that's there's natural products in the manufacturing of tires. So there's oil, there's natural rubbers, there's steel components. So with with exposure to wind, rain, sun, UV, they do have an impact on the tire. The general advice in Australia, uh, 
uh, and this is uh, through a bulletin on the Australian Tire Industry Council website. The advice is after five years to more closely check your tires or have your tires inspected by a um, professional retailer and then look out for things like cracks or damage to the tires. That's the general advice in Australia. In some countries, they do actually have uh, laws about how old the tires can be. So you can't retail tires if they're a certain age or you can't, you, know, you need to replace tires after a certain age. So in, in some countries, they do have those laws and they're, they're generally countries with high heat or high humidity and things like that. So, you know, there's obviously climatic effects that can impact the tires and their performance. But generally, if they're stored inside a, you know, a, a constant temperature, a bit like wine, I guess, like a good bottle of wine, if they're stored in a, a constant temperature away from light, they are pretty safe to keep uh, for a few years. And uh, for Hankook's warranty, so we, we actually offer our warranty from the date of sale. So we try and give consumers a peace of mind because we know that there are some consumers in the marketplace that are concerned about the life or the age of the tyres. So we offer a five-year warranty from the date of purchase. So we're saying to the consumers that we store the tyres in, in, in our warehouses and we know what we're doing with them. We know the where they've been and how long they've been there. And we know what sort of light and heat they've been exposed to. And uh, we're confident that when you buy them from us, they'll still be good for the next five years. And that's uh, why we offer our warranty instead of, instead of being from the date of manufacturer, it's from the date of purchase. So the consumer has that peace of mind. It's a, it's a very refreshing position to be in from the date of retail as opposed to manufacturer because it, you know, because I often think of these guys that have collector cars like mine behind me here. Those tyres are pretty old. I was talking to one of our customers. He's lucky enough to own a, own a Ferrari and he was saying that Ferrari recommend a five-year replacement cycle on, on the tyres. Uh, you know, he doesn't drive it very much as probably most Ferrari owners don't for, to, to maintain the safety and integrity of, of the vehicle. They, rec- they recommend that he replaces the tyres every five years. Tyres and, and life cycle. Cycle and uh, and the environment. Like tires have always had this stigma for many many years. Like used tires and old tires. I'm just keen to get an understanding of what happens to tires after they've been used. Do they end up in the you know, the Simpsons have got the, there's always the the tire dump that's on fire for you know, eternally. It's always burning and there's smoke coming out of it. What's the process? How, how does how does the industry get rid of tires here in Australia? And, and it is a, a, a relevant issue. The Simpsons, as they you know, as we found out when Donald Trump became president you know they're, they're not that far from the truth most of the time they're pretty accurate but yeah in Australia uh, most of the major retailers and, and reputable independent retailers they'll have a process through the government EPA Environmental Protection Agency either a national or state bodies where they accredited collectors will come and collect the tires and have a chain of, you know, of responsibility I guess you'd call it so they give them a receipt for the tires that they've collected and then they'll take the tires to an authorized or you know proper disposal channel and they they'll get signed over. So the retailer you know, has a bit of paper saying I've done the right thing and here's the chain of custody of, of my tyres. But unfortunately, not everyone does that. Not everyone follows that that process. And there's an association called Tire Stewardship Australia and they're involved in sort of trying to find better ways to, to recycle tyres, more environmentally friendly ways to recycle tyres. And the Australian government, you know, I think last year was announcing you know, different changes to recycling, not just on tyres, but plastics and containers. And, and exporting of uh, plastics and, and, and things like that. So tyres fall under that category. So at the moment, it, it's kind of all a, a, an honour system or a hope everyone does the right thing. But yeah, there are stories of lots of tyres sitting in paddocks. There's stories of tyres being collected in warehouses and then the person who signed the lease disappearing. So the owner of the building uh, having to dispose of the tyres before they can lease the warehouse out again. So there are lots of horror stories. But as, as a general rule, the industry does do the right thing. The tyres get disposed of either through exporting to countries that burn them. They, they export them in bales to, to get remanufactured. And then locally here, using them in roads is a, is a big uh, push by the Tire Stewardship Australia and local governments. And I think there was a statistic that I read that if all the new roads in Australia were built with a, a compound containing the rubber from used tyres, then we'd have to actually have to start importing tyres to meet the demand. So there's certainly um, ways to get rid of them, but like most new technologies, Technology in the environment, it's a cost factor. So it's the costs need to come down to a more sustainable level to, to make it worthwhile. Put them in the roads. There's organisations here that shred them, I'm guessing, and then that compound is shredded and then mixed in with other polymers and then it creates the road surface. Yeah, exactly. So they call it crumb. 
And certainly in playgrounds, you might have seen sort of the soft uh, rubber floors in playgrounds. That's another area where it, where it gets used a lot. There's certainly uses for them, but it's finding a low cost way of converting them from a tire into a, a usable form. Now, I remember many years ago, retreading used to be quite popular. And I think quite a big percentage of tires used to be retreaded. Do you still see that happening? Because I think in agriculture, tractor tires could be retreaded or truck tires. Maybe not so much passenger. Is, does that still occur? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's uh, um, truck tires is the main market for retreading in Australia, and, and certainly in Europe, it's a it's a big market. So most sophisticated transport operators understand that there's an environmental benefit of retreading tires, and there's also a cost benefit for them as well. It's a lot cheaper to retread a tire and run it and maintain it than it is to to buy a new tire. But some of the challenges for smaller operators Operators is trying to keep track of the carcasses from the old tires and where do you store them, where do you where do you send them and how do you make sure you get them back and how do you make sure that the carcass of the tire is still a good quality carcass that can be retreaded versus the carcasses that may be been damaged uh, during its first life. So certainly certainly a big market in Australia and um, as I said, like a, traditionally a, 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 you know, someone would buy a tire for the steer of a truck. So on a truck you have uh, steer tires, which are different to tires uh, drive tires, which are on the axles driving the truck which are different to trailer tyres, which are carrying the um, the goods and freights. The traditional model is to buy the steer tyre, new steer tyres for, for safety reasons and performance reasons. Uh, when they get a bit low on tread, then you might move them to the, the trailer and run them on the trailer. And then as they've worn down below the legal limit, then you'd retread them and then run, keep running them on the trailer. So you're actually getting the, the maximum life out of the carcass of that, that tyre. And in, if you can manage it correctly, there certainly are some cost savings for you as a, as a fleet operator. But otherwise, from a passenger perspective, nobody retreads tyres anymore. No, there's no, there's no more retreading. There is, um, there's actually, there's, there's one company. I, I, well, there's probably still a few around. But one of our customers down in Melbourne, they're, they're traditionally a, a tyre retreader business, being operating for maybe 50 years. They found a market for coloured uh, retread tyres, and what they would do is they, they, they found a big market in the US uh, where they could make blue tyres and they could make pink tyres, and apparently in the US. Um, what people would do is they'd have a baby shower to surprise their guests on what gender the baby was going to be. They do burnouts in the street, and the colour of the smoke would indicate the baby's gender. The business in Melbourne found a great export market for their retread tyres, uh, having them in different colours. There's not much of a market, but there's definitely there is a market somewhere. A particular business they've got about uh, last time I was there, that, and I found this out. They had like about 30 different machines for retreading that they they used all throughout the 80s and early 90s, and they just never got rid of the machines and one of the sons of the owner found the opportunity and now they've got half of those machines producing gender reveal tires so yeah it's- that's incredible so is it a full casing that they put around it yeah so basically so you you wear the you buff the tire down to to a to the level the you know, whatever the level is and then you just wrap them in a big elastic band if you just want to imagine it like that a really thick elastic band and you put them in and you re-vulcanize the rubber in in the mold and sticks together if you do it properly so the sidewalls blue as is the tread or is a sidewall black oh with those ones so the tread's blue or pink so the sidewall's still black the traditional thing but yeah the tread's blue or, blue or pink and they even have rainbow tread too for, for people who are coming out now from a marketing perspective mark i'm keen to because uh, when, when we look at the auto industry marketing is everything and it's all about getting the funnel uh, getting people in the top of the fun- of the funnel and working them down so how does the industry market ties to the public i suppose marketing ties is, is similar to every other you know product or service so you you've got to create awareness of the brand i think some of your other guest speakers have, have spoken about you know paid advertising and then owned and earned and when you start to get into pr so paid advertising or create the brand awareness is around things like performance of the products and traditionally that would be maybe you know racetrack type performance uh, but now it's also off-road performance has become a big a big sort of market that you're trying to advertise to and, dem- and demonstrate your credibility to then safety is a is another element that you would use a lot of the surveys we've done with with consumers asking them about important what's important to you when you consider tires uh, safety always ranks up really highly and, and often ranks above price when, when you're asking them in a survey. And then um, environment 
is another aspect, the low rolling resistance, uh, reduced fuel consumption. It's another aspect that some brands use to create awareness of their brand and attract consumers to their brand over other brands. Yeah, Hankook, we, our tagline is driving emotion. So we're trying to connect performance of the tyre with the emotion of the car and, and driver, you know, create the experience and the pleasure of driving. So it's not just about getting from A to B, it's about enjoying the drive and, and being safe and being comfortable and, and, and but having good performance. So it's, it's, it's trying to almost bring everything into the emotion that, you know, is connected to cars and connected to automotive um, as well. Some of the other brands sort of obviously focus purely on performance, you know, maybe through motor racing sponsorship or um, or other other elements. You know, one of the major brands several years ago got out of motor racing and decided to focus on the environment and they sort of really push that low rolling resistance aspect of their tyres and uh, reduce fuel consumption. So every manufacturer, you know, or every brand is, is probably trying to take a slightly different different approach, but it's it's all about trying to engage the consumers in, in, in the quality of the brand and, um, you know, and, and overcome their indifference to the round and black piece of the rubber with a hole in the middle. So in terms of marketing activities, what sort of media do you find most effective for you? Hankook, we're we're big on uh, sports marketing. So globally, we're heavily invested into sports marketing. Uh, We're involved in the European uh, football through the Europa League uh, and also sponsorship of the Real Madrid team in the US, uh, Major League Baseball um, in Germany, uh, one of the one of the football teams, I think it's Dortmund that we're a sponsor of. Um, and then locally in Australia, it, it's uh, currently through the NRL. We have a major major sponsorship with the NRL. Over the years, we've worked with um, the, a couple of AFL teams as well to have that sports marketing sponsorship. And we think, you know, as a brand that links us to performance, you know, it's all about performance and about high performance. So we think that's a good fit with our brand and it gives us a good awareness amongst amongst the customers. And traditionally, the the, the tyre buyer is, is that male 25 to 40, 25 to 50 sort of male. They're traditionally the, the buyer of the tyres. Sports marketing generally links well into the market segment or the target market, which is uh, the male purchaser. I think it's an interesting uh, approach. I think it's a very, very wise one because if you think of your, the target market, as I say, you're going for a performance and you're differentiating as a performance brand, going for that emotional link with with, whether it be the the Premier League or you know, with Real Madrid or even the with NRL, uh, and that male buyer is the one that will be discretionary about what they do with tyres. Whereas not being sexist, but a female buyer is seeing it as it's an expense. I need to get tyres. I'm indifferent to it. Whereas I will pay more if I have an emotional attachment to it. I'm going to get an emotional experience of performance from this particular tyre, and especially if it's a big uh, LCV that you want to upsell me into uh it's very it's very clever it's trying not to be sexist about who the buyer is and i um you know i've, I've got two daughters and I, so i think about trying to think about who the buyer may be quite often all the research we do tells us that the buyer is predominantly male standing in a tire store listening to the conversations even if they're the female at the counter more than half the time they'll say let me check with my husband give me a minute let me make the phone call and just it just happens so often that, that it quite it crystallizes who the actual buyer is or who who the decision maker is out and about in the tire stores and hearing those conversations. And then how do you find the best method to communicate features and benefits uh, over price? Communicating the features and benefits is really hard uh, in the tire industry because, you know, they all look pretty much the same unless unless you've been trained or, or, or someone has taken the time to point out the differences to you. So we rely heavily on the retailers to train them and, and make them aware of our products and make them aware of not necessarily what makes our product better than uh, another brand but what you know what are the features in in our our performance tires that make it a performance tire or what are the features in our passenger tires that make it better in the wet um, and, or what are the features in our tires that make uh, give you longer mileage um, or what you know better handling or, or low noise so it's more about pointing out features that we have and, and some of them are, are unique some of them are common across across many brands but like any product when you know as a buyer myself when I go in to buy a set of you know headphones or a TV when the person who uh, is in the store takes a 
time to maybe explain, you know, what the benefits are, right? Yeah, you, know, you build that rapport and you build that trust, and and then they're able to sell me a product that may be a, a higher price or or more than I, I was planning to spend originally. So the road to sale in tires is very similar. You get customers that come in and say, I just want the cheapest tire. I'm selling the car next week, and if that's all they want, then that's what you know. As a retailer, that's what you do. But quite often, you get customers coming in saying, What do you recommend? You know, the tires are really bad in the wet. I want something that'll be better in the wet, or they didn't last long enough. I want I want more mileage. So you know, often buyers will give you that signal, and 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 you know, we try and train the retailers or you know, coach the retailers into understanding what the signals are, knowing what the the features are, and then being able to translate that into a benefit. You know, promote our brand uh, above other brands. So. Now, Mark, one question I was going to ask you: Re Motor Racing. You mentioned that you're sponsoring the Formula E. Is there in the old days from Holden, et cetera, and Ford, it used to be win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Win on the race tech on Sunday, sell sell on Monday. Is there a correlation between if your brand is seen, whether it be in Formula E, Formula One, or off-road racing, is there is there a link between that and people saying, look, I really want your brand. I want, want Ankle because I see it doing really well in the Paris to Dakar or something like that. I think there is, and it, it comes down to the retailers again. So, so, you know, motor racing is one of those sports that if you're in the industry, you love it. You know, it doesn't matter whether what they're racing. You, if you're an industry person or you're a car person, you, you follow it. So a lot of our retailers, uh, they're all car people. So they see a brand in Formula One, then, then in their mind, that brand is a performance brand and a quality brand. So motor racing does play a big part in influencing them. And then they they then influence the consumer. A, a consumer who doesn't care really about cars wouldn't really care, probably not interested in motor racing either so the the advertising in motor racing is not going to influence their purchase decision but if they walk into a retailer and the retailer is passionate about the brand because they've got that connection via motor racing then that certainly does help yeah and in terms of how competitive is it at the retail level you mentioned in the beginning of your market share around 10 percent. do you have all the brands there is it do you then have to convince the retailer to recommend your brand against these other brands the retail market is, is extremely competitive. The internet has created more transparency around price, but there's still plenty of opportunity for, for good old fashioned service and, and selling. You know, as a wholesaler, we've got to convince the retailer to keep, to stock our brand. They have a number of brands that they can keep in their shops. So through building rapport with them, through their knowledge of the product, uh, through the service levels, we obviously work with them to to keep our brand on, on the shelves as a preferred brand. So it's, it's really competitive, but that's just the start of it. So we might convince a retailer to keep hand cooks on the shelf and they're all excited about that and they're, they're happy with the product and everything like that. But then the consumer comes in and says, well, I can buy them $5, the same hand cooked brand down the road for $5 cheaper. So then the retailer's got to then compete on the brand. And I suppose that's where the transparency of the internet comes in. They can see that retailer A has them for a hundred, and you need to be a hundred. A minimum, you need to be at least a hundred dollars or close to a hundred dollars to try and keep the consumer. But as far as the, I mentioned before, people don't walk into a tire store and say, oh, "I'm just looking, just wanted to check to see whether they're round and black." Still, when they walk into a tire store, they're actually there to buy tires. As a retailer, you need to be aware of what the market is, not just, you know locally, but you know nationally, perhaps as well with national retailers. But if you know you've got a, a store down the road who's got a big Bridgestone sign out the front. Thank you chances are they're going to be selling Bridgestone. So when the customer comes into you, chances are they've been there and there and got a quote. So as a retailer, you need to understand your market. So then you know what you're quoting and you need to keep them in your store with, by selling the features and the benefits of the brands that you have on the shelf. And you know, my job is obviously to make sure it's handcuffed they've got on the shelf and they understand how to explain those features and benefits. Then they build the trust with the consumer and hopefully they, yeah, they get the sale. So yeah, it, it is ultra competitive for a wholesaler trying to get space on the shelf. Uh, then it's ultra competitive for the retailer trying to fight against other retailers and, and, and be, be price competitive in a very transparent pricing market. Yeah. So, Mark, how do you differentiate as the wholesaler to get your unfair share of that retailer's attention? You've got to have the product that suits their market. They've got to be comfortable with your delivery schedules. They've got to be comfortable with the sales rep comes and calls on them. They've got to be comfortable with the colour of your logo. They've got to be comfortable seeing your brand out in, out in the marketplace. They've got to know that you have a good warranty and not only that it's written on paper, 
paper that you back it up when the time comes. We offer things like road has a warranty on some of our products. So to try and provide that peace of mind. Uh, we have other, other products where we offer a mileage guarantee to offer the peace of mind. Uh, we have other products where we give a, a, a free return after 30 or bef- within 30 days. If you put the tires on and for some reason you think they're not performing as promised, you know, you can return them. So we have a number of different elements that we offer the retailers and the best example, you know, the mileage guarantee. So if someone consumer comes in and says, look, I want to buy some tires and I want them to last longer than the set that I just, that I'm replacing. The retailer doesn't have to guarantee it. They can just say, well, look, Hankook will guarantee it. Uh, here's the warranty. If you buy this pattern, you will get an 80,000 kilometer guarantee. So Hankook believe it's you know good enough. So that's hopefully will convince the consumer to choose our brand and, and solve their problem at the same time. That's a pretty powerful story. But in the cut and thrust of retail, you know, where you've got people calling in sick, you've got parts that haven't turned up, you've got lots of people at the counter. Being able to tell that story every time is a challenge for the retailers and it's certainly a challenge for me and my team to make sure the retailers understand it well enough to be able to then translate it uh, to the consumer or, or exp- pass it on to the consumer in a way that makes them feel comfortable and makes them understand it. Would many customers be aware that you offer a mileage guarantee? So from a consumer level, once again, it comes down to the retailers. They, have, they do have such a strong influence over, over that side of the business. So they, it's up to them to explain it. So we certainly do our job to produce all materials, market it through paid advertising, through social media and things like that. And we're certainly trying to push it as a strength of our brand. But we're not the only ones. You know, several brands do offer different or similar guarantees. So it's just up to the retailers just to make sure that they're doing explaining it to the consumer and making the consumer aware so they feel confident in the product they purchased because a set of tires can be up to a thousand dollars so that's not sort of money that you want to give away without being confident in the product you've purchased that's amazing john would you be aware that you could get a guarantee on uh, on four tires that you purchased I was, I was definitely not aware of that especially a mileage guarantee because you said there's so much impact from the way the person would drive the vehicle we offer a service booklet or a tire care booklet to, to to ensure you qualify for the warranty you've got to get your tires maintained and serviced and come back and, and you can't just drive like a you know a stolen rental car and and then come back and say, oh, sorry, it didn't work. Can I get my money back? You've got to actually you know, take ownership of the maintenance. In terms of automotive, a really important part of success is that relationship between the OEM and the dealer. How do you see the relationship between you and your retailers? How would you describe that? I think it's really, really strong at the moment. Every brand goes through its different challenges. And as you change direction, you effectively change their business. But it's really about open and honest communication with the retailers and, and treating them like a partner. We don't have direct franchise arrangements with our retailers like you know, an OEM would do. So there's, I suppose, really no obligation on us to treat them or communicate with them or, or honour any legal contra- franchise contracts. But they're part of our family. You know, we rely on them so much. And so many retailers that have been selling the Hankel brand for 20, 30 years, ever since it's been available in, in Australia. And, you know, they love the brand more than I do. You know, their families are, are part of the brand more than I am. I like to think, think of myself as a, as a custodian of, of the hand cooked brand at, at this point in time. And ideally, it's a long reign as, as, as a custodian, but people that have been doing, been associated with the brand a lot longer than me. So we've got to respect their passion for the brand and we've got to work with them in an open and honest way. We've got to educate them on our products. We've got to educate them on our stock, on our challenges. Um, we've got to be clear in our, our pricing communications, uh, in our promotional direction. Yeah, we, we obviously have retailers that don't sort of like decisions we make, but we've just got to try and work with them and discuss with them and then we've got retailers that love the decision that we're or the direction that we're heading in and you know that and that's really great because obviously as a a brand or as a wholesaler we kind of don't make decisions to sell less tires we we use our best knowledge to try and improve their business as well as improving our business so yeah it's it's not as strong as you know we've got to work harder i guess because it's not a franchise arrangement we've got to work harder to keep their trust and earn their trust and and keep them choosing us over the 10 or 20 or 30 other brands that they could choose for their business and uh, just as far as retail campaigns are concerned, I'm being on the sales side, you know, it's all about you know, what uh, what drives the activity. What retail campaigns work best in the tyre business? Is it like a finance campaign? Is it a three for one or four for, four for the price of three? What, what tends to be the best way to, to move rubber? It's it's interesting that, you know, the four for three campaigns that have been become the norm started back in 
the sort of 2012. I think Bridgestone, you know, launched their one in early 2012. I think maybe Burrapes had been doing them on a smaller scale before that. So then it started out two months of the year, um, Bridgestone would run a four for three and then maybe another two months, another brand would run it. And you get these massive spikes in sales and then maybe you recover the next month, but overall you would sell more tires. But come 2019, I think most brands were on four for three promotion for six to eight months of the year. So there really was no no difference in in the sales volume. You were just fighting each other again and everyone was offering a four, a four for three promotion. So the industry's really got to, got to think about how we do it differently and COVID's changed that a little bit and it'll be interesting to see what direction you know, we take next year with our promotions. But we definitely need to do something similar to the car business. But consumers want value. You know, they don't buy tires every month or every week. They only buy them maybe every every three years or four years. So when they walk into a retailer, they want to know that they're getting value and they want to know really that tire used to cost 200, but they'll get it today for 150 because that's the offer for them. And if they see that value, then they, you know they, they feel comfortable about their purchase. They don't have that buyer's remorse that they spent a thousand dollars and you know could have got it cheaper somewhere else. So yeah, so traditionally, yeah, you know, promotions that discount the tire is what drives a lot of value uh, or a lot, a lot of sales, but it, it really has plateaued because everyone's doing the same thing the last two or three years. So uh, we need to look around in the industry for different ways to to, to move the rubber. What would you say is terms of the best uh, best practice from a sales perspective in the tyre industry? Quite interesting. I'm, there's one national retailer that does online sales. And um, uh, I remember them telling me a story a few years ago that the, the internet did a better job selling wheel alignments than their staff behind the counter. You know, when you buy tyres, uh, especially, you know, every time you, you buy two tyres or four tyres or every time you get your tyres inspected, I would certainly recommend a, real, a wheel alignment of the vehicle to make maintain the, the integrity of the, the suspension components and, and ensure the tires are going to wear wear correctly but you know it, a, a good wheel alignment can cost 80 to 100 dollars so so best practice is certainly to re- be recommending that in the industry and, and encouraging people to maintain their tires so they last you know as long as as long as they should or as long as they can. But yeah, this this particular retailer, you know, I remember them telling the story that the, the conversion rate on wheel alignments was better. The internet or their computer did it better than what the counter staff did. And and their view of it was that by online selling, they were able to provide more information, some videos and and, and some, some reasons why the consumer should actually invest in the wheel alignment because it's going to be cheaper for them longer term. Whereas at the counter, there's so many things going on that maybe the person sitting behind the counter doesn't have the time or to offer gets or is scared to ask for it for more money. But there's definitely, you know, best practice is probably around informing the consumer, you know, explaining to them that tyres need maintenance and, you know, to get the value out of your tyres, you need maintenance and that whether that's a wheel alignment, whether that nitrogen instead of normal air, whether that's a rotation, whether that's coming back every 10,000 Ks or six months, those sort of things. So there's certainly best practice in selling. And and I suppose as I'm, as I'm talking and I'm explaining it, I'm thinking it's you know, by putting the customer first, or putting the consumer first and thinking in the best interest of the consumer is ultimately you know the best practice and and that will give you you know return and repeat sales in the longer term. Now Mark you mentioned nitrogen. I'm keen to ask more information. How does that work? You put nitrogen in the tire instead of normal air. The technical explanation is the nit- nitrogen tires or rubber is porous. So air does leak uh is it out of the ru- out through the rubber itself, out between the gap, the the the, the, the surface between the wheel and the tire or out through the valves is is you know and it doesn't leak a lot over time, but it, d- it does leak. So the technical explanation is the nitrogen molecule molecules are actually bigger than, than oxygen. So therefore, it's harder for them to leak out through those porous surfaces or through those gaps. So uh, the pressure can be maintained longer with, with pure nitrogen rather than a mix of nitrogen and air, which you know is made up in nitrogen and oxygen, which is made up in the in the atmosphere. I'm keen to ask about the, John mentioned it before, so the, the, t- the typical road to the sale to buy a tyre. How, how does that work? And what, what, can you just give us a, an overview of what that typical road to the sale to a tyre is? So it, it's it's probably quite simple. And so people take their car in for a service and the mechanic says, hey, you need tyres. And the other person says, okay, well, what do you recommend? And they'll go, well, I've got this one for $80. I've got this one for $70. And I've got this one for $50. And the consumer might say, well, I don't want the most expensive, but I don't want the cheapest either. I'll go for the one in the middle. And uh, you know, that's probably a very simplistic explanation of, of how tyres get sold. And it, it's obviously a lot more complicated than that. And we've spoken about selling features and benefits and we've, we've spoken 
spoken about brands, we've spoken about warranties and, and things like that. But, you know, no one, very, very rare people are, are kind of waking up in the morning and doing their pre-vehicle check before they head out to work to inspect the tires it's normally that someone tells them hey you need tires and whether it's whether it's a friend or whether it's a car person whether it's you know at a at a, um, a scheduled service that's not that's normally the signal signal for tires so you know at the start we, we talked about the size of the market and um, I think uh, 18 million tires was kind of the best guess of the industry you know I reckon it's it's probably closer to 30 if everyone actually checked their tires and, and got them replaced when they when they needed but uh, you know, uh, we've we've done some work with some of our retail partners, and I think there was a story published in the media. Uh, Bob Jane, uh, one of the, the, the one of the people that Bob Jane quoted a statistic, something like thirty percent of the tires they inspected for customers uh, needed replacement, and that was from the fleet person of Bob Jane. So he he would go out to company fleets and 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 do tire inspections as part of their supplying of tires, and and they would find on average about thirty uh, percent needed replacement uh, at any one time. And you would think that company cars are probably better maintained than in older, you know, sort of private vehicles because you know, there's a requirement to maintain the cars for the occupational health and safety practices and policies of the company. So um, to, to find such a high percentage of tyres that need replacing in that kind of fleet indicates there's probably a higher percentage in the in the general fleet that need replacing, yeah. So when a customer comes in to have his car serviced and the technician says, well, you need new tyres, is there a percentage of those customers that jump on their phone and do a quick Google search before for making a decision? Or do you think they all trust what the recommendation is coming from that retail supply? I think there definitely is. And even more so that people are, you know, because the pricing is so easy to find and so transparent, people are checking checking the pricing. And those car dealerships, you know, there's a big opportunity for car dealerships to sell more tires because they see the cars generally in, in, you know, in that first 12 months, 18 months, two years, and they're still seeing the cars at the same time when the tires need replacing. So I think most dealerships or manufacturers you talk to, they lose the car after three years uh, once the warranty ends or once they, you know, they start to go to a private work. Workshop. But the tire opportunity generally occurs in that first two, maybe two and a half years, because the vehicle is starting to do the kilometres that are going to cause the tires to to wear and, and get close to their end of life. Car dealerships traditionally would buy tires, and then they'd add the parts department would add their standard markup, and then the service department would add their standard markup. And next thing you know, the tires probably double the price of, of what it should be in the market. And then that creates an issue for trust with, between the customer and the dealership. Well, you, I can check my tire price, and I know you. you you're charging me too much for that. What are you doing with your servicing? Are you charging me too much for that as well? When we work with car dealerships, we, you know, we first off try and create the opportunity in their mind and say, hey, you know, you've got the car, you're doing your 20, 30, 50 point inspection anyway as part of your manufacturer requirements. Why not sell the tires at, at the same time? And and then when you sell the tires, don't treat them like a filter or don't treat them like brake pads. You've got to treat them like tires. There's a whole market out there, you know, sets the price in the market. And if as a business, you've been able to make your profit on your service and you, you charge your hourly rate and, you, and you, you've done all that. If you then make the tire sale, well, that's that, that's that's bonus GP or that's bonus bonus income and that's customer retention, customer trust, and you become the one stop shop for your customers. It's it's really important that when they're inspecting vehicles, they check the tires and and they attempt to keep the customer and sell them some tires as well at, at a fair market market value because consumers can just get on their phone and, and catch them out fairly fairly easily, uh, whether it's a, a dealership or a, or a tire retailer. So and so the digital journey for that customer they've come into the, the dealership or or the service center to get a service Kelly tells them I need you, you need to replace two tires or four tires the customer takes their car away if they don't get it done there and then therefore would it be fair to say that that business or that service out there is at significant risk to lose that opportunity to sell those tires the customer goes off goes online looks at tires does the video oh, okay, I really should be getting a wheel alignment. So the next place that they contact, would it be fair to say that that organisation is the one that's going to get that business? Pretty much. If they've got a quote from the person who who, who identified the tyres need replacing, they've already got a benchmark price. And if the person who, who gave them the quote hasn't done the job explaining brands, explaining features, explaining venomates and built 
you know, some trust or built some education or given some education to the consumer, then all the consumer needs to do is get at eight o'clock at night when they're watching TV, type in 205 55 16 tyres and they're going to get a whole number of listings of, of prices and brands. And, and unless the consumer understands the brands or, or is familiar with the brand, you know, potentially pick the cheapest price and, and they can do that online. They, they, you know, a lot of companies allow them to transact online. So if they're comfortable in doing that, they can transact offline, online and, and book an appointment and give their credit card and the transaction's made so the, the opportunity's lost. Um, or you know, they can get on the phone the next day and, and make a couple of phone calls and then it's the uh, the retailer that handles the phone call the best or, or the retailer that handles the store visit the best that will get the sale. So do they send many like digital inquiries or is it mainly I'm going to call or I'm going to walk in? It, it, it's an interesting, you know, as a, as a wholesaler, we we don't get to see the journey uh, end to end. We we only see part of the journey and we work closely with our retail partners to understand what that journey is. Uh, may be so we find we find some of the smaller retailers will get a lot of inquiries so they their website may not have pricing on them on it so they'll get especially via Facebook uh, seems to be you know a, a way people you know inquire all the time so and whenever you talk to an independent retailer all the inquiries are there when they come in in the morning so there's definitely people at night on Facebook seeing an ad that the retailers posted or seeing something the retailers posted and then they're direct messaging you know how much for this or how much for that and there's definitely conversion rate so I can, I, I've never written down the numbers to work out the exact percentage, but there's, I get the feel that, you know, they get 10 inquiries, three of them are genuine and they'll, they'll make one sale or something along those lines. There's, def, there's definitely a, 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 rate, a conversion rate there. I remember talking to one of the um, one of the online retailers many years ago when, when it first started to come out and, and they were able to, to manage their conversion rates based on the search terms. So if someone types in cheap tyres, then chances are they, they don't know what they want yet. They're not quite ready to make a purchase, they're just looking around. But if someone types in a 205, 55, 16, hand cooked K435 Kinergy, chances are that customer is going to buy. They, you know, they know the size, they know the brand, they know what they're trying to replace, and they're pretty much convinced they're replacing that tire because that was maybe the OE fitment or the current brand that's fitted on the tire. So that online retailer then knew to set up their road to sale in a way that focused a lot more on that customer and maybe offered deals or promotions or incentives to get that customer versus the, the person who was searching cheap tires and, and came to their website that way. So yeah, there, there can be a lot of smarts in that tire sale if, you know, for those online retailers, if they if they can make it work. Now, how important is product knowledge? Because it must be quite a challenge. You've got all these different brands, you've got these huge variation of tire specs and that. It must be very difficult, firstly, to get your own product knowledge across. So how important important is that and how do you manage that? Yeah, it's it's extremely important. You know, we've talked about the road to sale a couple of times and you know I, I, I firmly believe that if you if you can you know solve the customer's problem with your product knowledge and, and, and demonstrate to them that you know what you're talking about, that uh, that you'll build that trust and rapport and your conversion rate will be a lot higher. As a wholesaler trying to get that product knowledge into the retailer's hands to then give to the consumer, it is it is very difficult. In September this year, in the states that weren't in lockdown, we we had, you know, we we call product training months with our with our BDE. So each of our salespeople nominated a tire, like one of our patents, and then they took that tire from the warehouse and they put that in the boot of the car. And then the, every retailer they went into they roll the tire out of the boot into the into the retail shop and you know in a busy retail environment when a sales rep walks in and kind of leans up on the counter most people kind of oh yeah okay and you have a talk about the football but when a sales rep walks in sometimes awkwardly trying to control a tire as they're rolling it into the you know in through the door opening the door and holding it grabs a little bit of attention so you you, you know we, we found that regardless how busy the retailer is we always kind of get that five minutes of attention or 30 minutes of attention depending on on, on the store so, so that really allows us to to then talk about our products and, and share some of the knowledge. So, you know, a couple of little tricks like that that we use to try and grab their attention long enough to impart the knowledge. And yeah, that worked really well in September for us. And how do you like segment the uh, the buy types with customers? You, we mentioned there's the, the gender segmentation enthusiasts and the uh, and the the ones that are just want some tires for transport. But even the fleet side of it, so does the industry segment it to, to great detail, or is it kept fairly generic? Yeah, no, there definitely are segments. So I suppose when you when you talk truck, like trucks, one segment that uh, you know is very specific, and the people selling truck tires generally don't sell car tires because there's a different level of skill, different level of knowledge. Knowledge. It's different conversations, and interests as well, and then fleet is definitely you know a segment in itself, and so the retailers would typically chase those segments. So someone.
someone like Bob Jane or Jax or Tire Power or even my car, they will have dedicated fleet pricing, dedicated fleet service levels, dedicated fleet people that will go into, whether it be a local council or a, or a leasing company um, or a, small, a local small business, they'll be chasing that type of business. They're, they're, they're starting to emerge different segments uh, amongst the four-wheel drive communities. Maybe a um, not so much an ARB, uh, you know, because they're, they're mainly focused on their products and, and stuff, but there are little independent businesses that are focused on four-wheel drive equipment, bull bars, tow bars, compressors, all that and that type of stuff, lift kits. And then, so there'll be, a, there's an emerging tyre segment there. Those guys maybe not, will maybe focus on lift kits in their mechanical workshop. So if we, if you can get them recommending your tyres, then they're, they're doing the lift kit and fitting hand-cooked tyres. So there's definitely a segment there. You know, car dealerships, you know, as a, as a wholesaler to us, that's, that's a completely different segment. You've got to teach the car dealership, well, you've got to help them identify the opportunity first. So when you go into a tyre retailer, they're already selling tyres. They already know how to sell tyres. I already know what tyres are. All you've got to do is convince them to sell your brand. When you go into a car dealership, you've got to teach, convince them to sell tyres, not just to sublet it or not just to use or refer it to someone else. You've actually got to te- teach them that there's money in tyres and this is how you do it. And then once you've done that, then you've got to actually teach them how to sell tyres to the consumer and you know talk about features and benefits. So yeah, you know, that's a whole different channel the tyre wholesale of brands like Hankook are, are working on and focusing on. But also, you know, vehicle manufacturers are also asking asking us to get involved because they want to keep the retention uh, in their service departments. They want to keep the customer from going to a mechanical workshop and finding out that they can get servicing and tyre there and not come back to the dealership. Yeah, and then I suppose probably lastly is the online channel. There are emerging retailers. Some have been around for a long while. Some are, st- some are just emerging now where they don't even have a tyre store. There's no bricks and mortar at all. All they have is a website and they will have uh, fitting stations and the customer will come online and they're the type of business that knows how to attract people to their website and know how to convert them on their website through, through their smarts and technology and they'll never even touch a tire all they'll do is a transaction over the internet and so that's another emerging channel started quite quickly back in sort of 2010 2011 12 when the internet first became you know more capable i guess it has stagmented it a little bit but uh, seems to be growing um, again now and, and gathering more paces consumers are more comfortable with online purchases generally is there any particular question we need to cover there or should we think of going to wrap up Mark? Oh, I think we should wrap it up. The final one for me is, is there any risk of disruption in the industry or can you see it consistent? Is the current status quo being maintained? So I suppose as far as disruption in the industry, the internet has been the biggest disruptor and it's been around for a long while now. So uh, transparency of pricing is probably what caused uh, the biggest disruption. But the, the, the strength of the industry or the, the thing that uh, keeps traditional tyre retailers going is someone still needs to fit the tyres. So you can't, you really can't fit the tyres yourself. It's not like a push bike tyre, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you need mechanical assistance. So, so even if you were to buy the tyres online and have them shipped to your home, you still got to take them to a retailer and get get them fitted uh, by by a professional. So yeah, so disruption seems to have stopped or disruptors. Uh, there's a couple of different business models that are operating, but they're still traditionally based around the bricks and mortar business that has tire fitting equipment and people that actually know how to fit the tires. Well, thank you, Mark. That's uh, that's been one hell of an eye opener for me. This subject we all take it for granted. I, I like your opening comments about yeah, they're they're black round. I've got a hole in the middle. There is so much to the tire business, the technology that we all take for granted, that footprint on the road. It is amazing, and even just how you go about retailing them and, and engaging with the uh, with the network. But so, thank you for coming on the show. So, when we look at the size of the market, we sell a million new cars a year, but you sell eighteen million tires. A a year in this country so that tells us something uh, that you know, it's a lot bigger than what the uh, the actual car business is and when we look at the major players Bridgestone Goodyear Dunlop and then Hancock right up there is uh, in third place and it's interesting when you talked about the market it's, um, it's been pretty flat 1% year on year uh, type growth but in, in the main fairly consistent all the way through and uh, when we look at the biggest uh challenge and I suppose where, where the market's trending the biggest challenges is complexity uh, with all the models coming in 
model complexity is one thing, but then you've got all these extra tile combinations that come into play and, and OEMs, we're notorious for changing something mid-spec, plus introducing way more models than what we really need. And we struggle with that, let alone what you have to deal with. Long after we've stopped selling a model, you've got to still maintain the tires for it. And just that whole complexity and consumer indifference to tires, because you know a lot of people just see it as a grudge buy. There are those, and I think that's interesting how you're differentiating your brand, which is a critical to how you've gone about it. Actually, you're differentiating your brand for performance and having more emotion attached to it because if there's emotion attached, then you can you can actually get a premium for your product, but also you can put better technology into the product where it's not just transport and that's it. So it's interesting just for the rim sizes. I'm, I'm with you. I'm an, an old uh, Commodore Falcon type guy and you know, 16-inch rims are now disappearing. That 205, 55, 16 was the main selling tyre. Now it's 18 and 19 inches and we're getting even more 20s coming in. And that 4x4 and SUV market is really changing the type of tyre that's, uh, that's in demand. But it's also interesting with COVID, you talked about uh, a lot of the uh, money being spent from the superannuation access funds, people buying wheel and tyre combinations to make their L- LCVs uh, sexier and uh, and more more appealing. But another one I was looked at as far as the supply chain, you mentioned that we've, we're at risk at the moment with shipping and just where tyres come from. So tyres basically come from where the manufacturing plants are. So no more in Australia. Bridgestone was the last one when Holden shut down. So Bridgestone's gone. So everything comes from where basically you manufacture vehicles. So Korea uh, is a big big supply uh, event, uh, pipeline for us, but also uh, out of Indonesia, which I thought was interesting. Uh, that was not aware that we get, get supply, which is, that's a that's a nice, good, convenient supply line, but even China. So, uh, but then the shipping challenges that you've got right now where there's capacity issues because there's demands being put on, uh, on the ships, et cetera. And as far as just supply and the ability for tires to come in that are grey imports that don't necessarily meet the specs of, uh, of what we expect a, a tire to have. So the ADR compliance, so there's a load rating and speed rating, but that's it. So tires aren't tires. There's actually a lot behind the scenes with a tire. And EVs, the, the technology when you, we look at EV with the torque and the weight and how that's impacting the tires. But just the technology around being quiet, I thought that was amazing. The average life expectancy being 60,000, I thought was amazing. I'm used to the 40,000K and you're out. Now it's up to 60 and, and better if you uh, go with, uh, you know, with with maintaining your tires. So wheel alignments, tire pressures and tire condition and just making sure they're, uh, they're in good, good order. And then you talked about the transactional side of things and it's very much that whole having a business partnership with your suppliers and that's how you differentiate. And then you offer some amazing uh, training to your retailers, which really, which is the critical piece. You mentioned that really it's, it, they can do the research online, but ultimately it's at the coalface where it really happens and the trust that you have with your deal, your, your agents and they have in you. And that trust then flows through to the customer and those agents giving that quality advice because it's all about fixing the customer's problem not really just trying to push some tires that they don't really need. So training that, and I like your, your approach when you said the sales rep goes in and wheels in the tire to engage them because, you know, that's the prop is one thing, but then it's, I've got now, now I've got your attention. I can actually talk about what the really is about this tire. It's not just a rubber thing with a hole in the middle, but even things like your mileage guarantee, I was oblivious to that. And John was the same. So now that's a really strong peace of mind reassurance that differentiates you from other brands that you offer this. And as long as you meet the requirements as far as maintaining the tyres, et cetera, then there's, uh, there's that peace of mind uh, as far as you, your, uh, your confidence in your brand. It said one thing that really resonated, and this came through and comes through with many of our podcasts when we talk to senior executives globally about the business relationship with your supply chain and your network. And it's the open and honest communication and you treat them like a true business partner and that family. And you mentioned, mentioned that you're the custodian of the, of the Hancock brand. And that is that, that, that resonates with all the key leaders that we've interviewed on this show. And it's a credit to you that you your, yourself and your organization follow that philosophy. So, uh, and that then flows into what, how you create best practice through the network with wheel alignments, videos, and, and the information around that. Amazing insights to the tire business. 18 million tires a year. That's nothing to uh, sneeze at. And uh, really thank you for your 
time sharing this information with us. Have I missed anything? No, no, that's it. I suppose the, the key takeaway for anyone with the tyres is maintenance, tyre pressures. Uh, keep your tyre pressures up and they'll, they'll almost last forever. But it's been really great, guys. I, like This is something I obviously I live and breathe every day and I, I wonder whether people, whether it's as interesting to me as it is to anyone else. But, you know, I, I appreciate your feedback and I'm glad that, you know, it is in, you know interesting to someone other than me. So, um, yeah, great to be a part of the show. Yeah, Mark, also from me, thanks very much. I've been in the automotive game for 30 years and listening to you today i could just see your understanding of the topic and oh it's totally amazing and i I really learned learned huge amounts so thanks very much yeah thanks john thanks for listening today hopefully you enjoyed that as much as we did there's a lot more to tires than what most people think so a very detailed discussion with mark sybil if you need any more information on today's episode or you'd like detail on any subject we've covered on talking automotive please reach out to either john sinclair or myself mark palavestra on linkedin or leave a comment below please subscribe to the channel we've always got lots of different subjects related to the auto industry coming up so subscribe make sure you tick the Uh, the bell so you get notifications when we do upload a new podcast and thanks for listening thanks very much for listening Uh, we'll speak to you soon